Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to be doing something a little bit differently this morning than I normally do. Normally, at this point, I would encourage you to turn to a particular uh, passage in the Bible, and I would be speaking most specifically on that passage. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I'm going to be speaking topically, and so I'm going to be going through a lot of verses uh, and for that reason, I've put some of the key ones that I'm going to be talking about as, as printed out in your, in your bulletin. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be opening your Bibles or that you shouldn't, at least even afterwards, look at these verses and make sure that I've not taken them out of context. Uh, but it may help you because I'm, I'm not going to take the time that will allow you to, uh, to, turn, to turn to a particular verse before I mention that. So with that, that said, let me pray. Father, I do thank you for the opportunity this morning as we look to your word for answers to life and answers as to how we might serve and worship you most appropriately. Lord, I, I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would help us to be able to understand and seek application for that which we learned today. And I, Lord, I pray that you would just protect my mind, that you would give me clarity of thought, and that the things that, that I say would be uh, true to your word. And I commit myself uh, to you toward this end. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the culture in which we live, the, the work that we do, whether it's within the context of the home, whether it's outside of the home, has taken on just an incredible social significance. And what we do for work tends to uh, define our uh, significance, our identity, uh, and finding ourselves unemployed for whatever reason can mean being perceived as, as incompetent. For most of us, our work concerns over, over half of all of our waking hours. And the majority of workers, as I've observed in life, are absolutely bored with their jobs, with their work, and therefore, consequently, with life in general. For many, their work is just a job. It simply begins and ends with a paycheck. And I suspect that that's probably true of many of you here this morning. And for most of the people that I've known, whether they are the company president or whether they're an assembly worker or work in some other capacity, their work doesn't come easy. It's hard. And whether their take-home check is large or small, the paycheck is not an easy one. So why, why do you work the way you do? How do you look at your work? How should you look at your work? And is there any connection between what you do all day and what you believe God wants you to be doing? And let me say at this point that based upon what I read in the Bible and what I've observed in life, uh, if that's the case, you're never going to find ultimate meaning in either your work or, more importantly, your relationship with God. But getting people to evaluate why they work the way they do is almost impossible. Uh, they just work. They do what's expected of them, whether they like it or not. They, they find some outside enjoyable pursuits to make work bearable and hope that they can work enough years in order to get a, a pension and perhaps a retirement gift. And that's sad because our work is much more than this or at least it should be. And this morning I want us to realize that all work, whatever it is, all work is very important to God. It matters to him. Every legitimate job, whether it's what we might so call it as, as secular work or whether it's uh, working full-time as a pastor or a missionary, all of that is significant in God's sight. The fact is that God cares deeply about what you do all day and during those hours as you, as you go to work and work out your life. And knowing this should make a very significant difference in our attitude about our work. Uh, 
again, our, our work matters. It really matters to God. It's the biggest part of our lives. And if we aren't serving Christ in our day-to-day work, we really aren't serving him appro- appropriately in our lives. And whatever kind of a person we are on the job is the same kind of person we are when we leave that job. And if we don't see our work as being important to Christ, we'll likely that carry that same attitude over into all of the other non-work aspects of our lives. Now, if you've been living with the idea that perhaps the only work that matters to God is, is that of full-time ministers or missionaries, or that work is somehow a curse, or that it's impossible for Christians to maintain integrity in the marketplace and still play a significant role in their business or profession, then I'm asking you to please pay attention this morning because we're going to be looking at some things that the Bible has to say about work and why our work matters to God. First, I want us to see how God views our daily work. And the first thing we need to get cemented in our thinking is that God himself is portrayed throughout the Bible as a worker. From cover to cover, we see God calling, God making, God creating. God is a worker, and we see that over and over again. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, we read that on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And this same word for work that we find here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, is the same Hebrew word that we later find in Exodus 20, verse 8, in the Ten Commandments, where man is commanded to work for six days and then to rest on the seventh day. It's interesting to me that the same work word that is used for God's work is used for man's work. In Psalm 111, we read, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Again, it's important that we understand that God is portrayed as a worker whose work in many ways is like our work, very different, but in many ways he is a worker like we are workers. And his goal is to meet a broad range of of our physical and emotional and spiritual needs. And he, he created this, this planetary grocery store that we call Earth, and his work continues day to day to sustain his creation. He's a worker. He's a worker, and he cares about your physical needs. He's a divine pastor. He's a divine carpenter. He's a divine doctor. He's a worker. And so work has intrinsic value because God is a worker. But there's more. We've been created in his image. And I'm going to use the word as his co-worker, and I hope it doesn't drive you crazy, but I, I, I just wanted to leave you with the fact that, that God has created us and, and desires for us to work in a way that, that uh, assists him in the things that he wants done. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, God is introduced as a worker, but beginning in verse 26, the issue of man comes into play. Verse 26 reads this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible says that man was created to be God's co-worker, reflecting the image of God. Man and God, again, both workers. And we see this clarified somewhat in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 8 and following that. We read, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. God had made something out of nothing. And man's creative activity was to take that something that God had formed, namely the garden, and to cultivate it. We see this in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And God's work of creation was to be continued by man's as God's co-worker in that process. 
Now, if this is a new concept to you, as it was for me when I first realized this a number of years ago, that God has created us in his image to be his co-worker, to meet a broad range of things in and through our work, I hope that you'll recognize that that's part of the dignity that God has given you. Notice what it says in, in Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? Verse 6, you made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet as God's co-worker. That's why the Bible says that work is given to us by God as a gift. In Ecclesiastes 5.18, we read, Behold, what I, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all of the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for that is his lot. You see, work is a gift from God for us to bring him glory, to bring glory to himself. It's not a curse, as many think. It's not a curse given to God because of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And I say that because God gave Adam a job to do before sin ever entered into the world. And so sin was intended by God for man's good and God's glory. That was God's intention concerning work. Now, in terms of work, let me just say that all legitimate work can be an extension of God's work. Any work that meets a legitimate need that man has, that God wants met, is legitimate. And it's part of God's work in the world. Nurses help God meet the physical needs of people in their day-to-day work. Assembly workers at Beckton Dickinson, where, where I worked for a while as when I was still in the uh, healthcare industry, uh, are helping to provide products that medical workers will use to bring God's healing to many who are ill. Farmers, as well as marketers and accountants working for, for distributors and truckers, pallet makers, grocery workers who bring us the food that we need to satisfy our daily needs, are meeting a legitimate need. And any legitimate need can be seen as an extension of God's work. Or I should say any legitimate work can be seen as an extension. Now, obviously, things like theft are not legitimate, uh, nor are things like uh, selling drugs illegally. That doesn't qualify. And other forms of work can at least be called into question like the selling of radar detectors, which allow those who buy them to break the law, or working within the tobacco industry to produce and distribute a known cancer causer to people. The question we need to ask ourselves is, are we in a job that is meeting the needs that God really wants met? Are we working for a company? whether we're employed as a janitor or a secretary or an accountant or whatever, that's meeting the legitimate needs of its customers. Because all legitimate work, whether it's serving to provide for your own personal needs or providing for the needs uh, of others, for your neighbors, all of that is an extension of God's work and is a means of loving and serving serving and worshiping Christ. And that's what we're here to do this morning, aren't we? We're to love and to serve and worship Christ. That's why we've gathered together this morning. In Colossians 3, verse 23, which is a, a verse that I, I, I really did. I had this verse pasted on my desk, this verse that I'm going to read you while I was still working in the healthcare industry. Uh, we have a passage which, which I think pretty much sums this up. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. And then listen to this because it says it follows the fact that when you work, it says you are serving the Lord Christ. Our attitude should be that we work to love, worship, and serve Jesus Christ. Ultimately, your boss is not your employer, or at least it shouldn't be. Ultimately, your boss is Jesus himself. And can you imagine what a difference it would make 
if when you and I got up in the morning and we got ready to go to work, that the thought we had as we were going out the door is that we were not going out to serve just men, but Jesus himself. What a difference that would make in our day, in the way in which we approached our jobs. That Jesus was alongside, that, that he was the one to whom we are accountable for how we did our work and our attitude at our workplace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This passage tells us that we're to do our work with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And there's a parallel passage to this one that I just read in Colossians chapter 3. It's found in Ephesians 6, and I'm going to start looking at that in verse 5, in which it says this. It starts out with the word bondservants. And let me parenthetically add something of my own that's not written in the Bible, but I would say all workers, <laughs> okay? All workers, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. And then it, there's a key phrase, I think, that follows this. It says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. Now, if, if you've been taught that God will give eternal rewards for those who know him, for those who are faithful to him, you might want to pause for a minute here and think about what rewards God might give you for your work. And I say this because if I understand life correctly, most of life is given to work. And therefore, the greatest opportunity to be rewarded by God for faithful service occurs within the context of our workplace. The point of this passage is that as you do your work under Christ, sincerely, honestly doing his work, his way, you will be rewarded. And this should give you great hope, especially if you find yourself in a job that maybe you've been considering as as mundane and, and maybe meaningless and certainly isn't as glamorous as, as that which you wished you might might have, Uh, maybe like sweeping floors or assembling product, or young moms at home cleaning toilets and changing diapers, that you will be rewarded for your faithful service every day as you perform your work as unto Christ. Now, the fact that our work is connected to God's work, that every legitimate work is an extension of God's work, and that our work matters to God should, I think, have some very practical implications on our day-to-day attitudes and our activities while we're on the job. And I'm going to suggest five. The first implication that our work matters to God is a very simple expression, that God's work must be done God's way. That God's work must be done God's way. For most of you, it's easy to imagine that Pastor Dean's work, as our pastor, is doing God's work. So think for a moment about how you want our pastor to work on a day-to-day basis. How do you expect him to approach the people he works with? How do you expect him to act in resolving conflicts? What kind of integrity do you expect this man to have? How do you want him to respond to stressful situations? How do you want him to react when he is misunderstood? Well, those same standards that apply to Pastor Dean in full-time Christian work also apply to you because you also are in full-time Christian work if you are a believer in Christ. And there's a simple rule that God's work must be done God's way. Think about how you perform your work. Do you perform your work with excellence? 
Do you organize and plan out your day? Do you try to get the most for your employer while you're on the job? Do you try to be proficient and learn new ways in which to do your job better? What's your attitude towards others? What's the quality of the relationship that you have toward others? Would the people that you work for and with describes you as a person who cares for them as God would want you to care for them? Would they describe you that way? Do you have a stability in your life in the way in which you respond to stress? How do you respond to opportunities for ego gratification? Are you boastful? Do you seek to serve others? What kind of impact do you have on other people? You see, God's work needs to be performed God's way. And that's why it's so important that we have an ethical edge to our life. We're to be ethically distinctive, to stand in bold relief to those who are not believers or to those who are Christians that are not walking with the Lord. If you're a Christian, you have somebody inside of you that should so direct your energy and your effort during the, the day that your life will be so unique and so distinctive that your unsaved workers will want to know why. And you'll have an opportunity to tell them why. But there's a second implication that our work matters to God. And that is the fact that you are put in the midst of the marketplace. And it's a system that contains a lot of evil. And that puts you and me in an obvious uh, situ situation that's a dilemma. It's an ethical dilemma. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? It answers that in verse 15. So that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Without any doubt, you work in the street. You work in a pluralist, pluralistic environment. You work in the marketplace, and the people you work with do not share your faith, for the most part, or your ethical standards. And because of that, the Bible says that you are to stand out as beacons of light in a crooked and perverse generation. If, you, For example, you own the shopping mall across the, the road here, would you allow a, a strip joint to come in as one of your tenants? Would you work in a store that sells pornographic material? Would you work for a company that you know is knowingly defrauding its customers? Would you do that? And how should you go about determining when the company you're working for is dealing in such a way that you need to get out? Now, all of us participate in evil to some extent, simply because we live in an evil-filled world. I'll give you an example. An example is that I pay tax dollars that support some activities that are in clear violation of God's word, word, and yet I pay my taxes. Some participation in evil is unavoidable. But where God holds us responsible is when we're directly involved in evil. Uh, and for example... Uh, and I tried to think of an example where nobody would be able to say, you know, he's preaching at me today, or he's out to get me today. So hopefully, hopefully this isn't going to be seen by any of you as, as that kind of a thing. Uh, if you're a CPA and your boss comes to you and instructs you to fill out uh, a tax form in a way that you know is deceptive, you know it's not right, and you go ahead and do what you know is wrong, you'll be involving yourself in direct participation in evil. I remember reading something written by uh, Chuck Swindoll a number of years ago, and he says, if you, if you have to do wrong to be on the team, you're on the wrong team. <laughs> and then he goes on later beyond that and says, if that's the case, you need to get out. In the final analysis, we need to let Scripture in our spirit-guided conscience be our guide, and to have the 
courage to do what is right before God. Now, there are at least, I'm going to give you four other brief implications of the fact that our work matters to God, and and I'm I'm going to mention them only briefly. Uh, First, we're to live a lifestyle and a level of luxury that permits us to give to others in need. Second, we need to keep our work in its proper perspective, balancing out life's demands between our work life, our family life, our church life, our community life, in our personal life, which I think, among other things, means that we need to make sure we set aside time for a much-needed rest and leisure. Third, we need to perform our work in such a way that it inspires moral and spiritual excellence in Christians and non-Christians alike. And fourth, we need to teach our children the dignity of work and the pleasure of accomplishment and that only by determined ethical effort do we create things that are really worthwhile. And so I ask you, how can you be ethically distinctive in your workplace? How can you be ethically distinctive in your career? How can you be different in that respect, in your billing, and the way in which you approach your customers, in the pursuit of excellence on the job, in doing God's work God's way? The crux of the matter is that unless you can make a connection between what you do all day and what you think God wants you to be doing, you're never, ever going to find ultimate meaning in your work or in your relationship with God. If, for example, you're an insurance salesman, you need to be convinced that God wants insurance to be sold. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be but you need to ask yourself those kinds of questions. And, and, and if, if you're not convinced that that's something that God wants, I would say you're wasting your life if that's how you're going to spend the rest of your life working in that environment. And it, I think if the typical church in our day has failed to influence the culture as it should, it may well be because we as a church have failed to equip workers to do the work of God in our culture. We need to do God's work God's way, to be Christ followers and Christ bearers in the marketplace. Whatever that means, whether it's in driving trucks or mopping floors, selling product, processing orders, building homes, et cetera, et cetera. And we stand at a crossroads. I think the question before each of us today as as we prepare to leave is whether we're going to follow Christ or not. Which way will you and I go? And the choice is not so much the church's, it's ours. It's yours, it's mine. It's if God is looking at us eyeball to eyeball, and is asking us what our decision is going to be. And you and I will make that choice perhaps a thousand times in the next month, and perhaps a million times over the course of our lifetime. We'll decide whether or not we will live and work for Christ. And millions of other believers will be in the same situation. And as a generation, we will thus decide which way we will go. In conclusion, let me just say that our work and our life matters deeply to God. It really matters. And I pray that we'll be wise enough to decide to make our lives and our work pleasing to him. Father, I do pray toward that end, starting with myself, that you will help me to decide over and over and over again that indeed my desire, my focus will be to live out my life and do the things that I do in a way that would be pleasing to you and bring you ultimate honor. In Jesus' name, amen.